to be receptive to your word uh, so that we could hear, uh, leave here this morning knowing you better and loving you more. We love you and we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Blake. Can y'all uh, give Blake a round of applause and thank you. Thank you, sir. Hey, I just want to extend an, uh, an additional welcome to all of our guys watching online this morning. Uh, to you guys in the room, uh, I got to meet a gentleman over here, David, all the way from Arkadelphia to th- this morning, uh, get to help out. He helps out with our online ministry, uh, and he comes in from time to time this morning, and he, he joined us today. So I'm glad I got to meet you, David. Welcome to the, to the room today. Um, if you have a Bible, I want to invite you to open up with me to Philippians chapter 4. Philippians is one of my favorite, favorite letters, and I'm glad that we get to dive into it today. Uh, in my doctoral work, I got to steep myself even in Philippians chapter 2, which I would have loved to have jumped in, but God saw it fit that today we're going to jump into Philippians chapter 4. And it's fitting, very, very fitting, that of all the weeks and in how we have chronologically gone through this letter, that out of all the days that today God providentially saw it fit that would be in this text because disagreements are a part of life. How fitting on such a week that we've had that disagreements are a part of life. But so are victories. And I'd like to think that many of us in this room have been celebrating a great victory this week. Multiple reasons. And I want to remind us of something. As the church of Christ, as followers of Jesus Christ, we knew a couple things are true. That number one, our greatest victory is not in ourselves, not in a politician, but that of King Jesus, that of the cross of Christ and the empty tomb. That right there is the eternal victory that we claim and stake our lives in. And number two, the political victory that we have seen this week is not just a victory that we gloat in or celebrate in or boast in, but as the church of Jesus, dare I say we do say it's victory, but I want to say that we emphasize it's a great opportunity for us to continue to be salt and to be light because there is a disagreement still at hand. Disagreements are a part of life. In complex issues, and even in the most simple of matters. Look at the screen for a moment. If I had to say to you, one of these has to go for the rest of your life, you have to get rid of one of these meats. Which one has to go? Now I want you to think about it just for a second. Think long and hard. You don't have to over-spiritualize it. I'm going to pray about it. No, you don't. Just look. Okay? On the count of three, I want you to just shout out. Is it, is it brisket? Is it chicken? Is it shrimp? Or is it steak? On the count of three, which one has to go? One, two, three. Chicken. Wow. Wow. Did not expect that. As a matter of fact, if I had to be uh, opinionated and, and give my two cents, I would say shrimp. I could do without shrimp. Okay, I could not do without brisket or steak, okay? I could not do without those two. It, it, all in agreement on that? Okay, God's people, amen. But we know this to be true. Conflict is never easy, but it's always easier to avoid. We might avoid conflict. We might be anxious about how another person might take it or how we enter it. And commonly, mostly with conflict by either avoiding it or, dare I say, we talk about someone rather than talking with or to someone in our conflict. And in the context of the church, people and us can be found guilty of simply avoiding it, talking around, hurting one another, and deciding just to simply leave to go find a different church. The title of our lesson today is How Christians Handle Disagreements. How Christians 
handle disagreements. And so our context and setting up in Philippians chapter 2, coming out of Philippians 3, is imperative. It's imperative because in chapter 3, Paul has just spoke about our kingdom citizenship. Our kingdom citizenship that we live in and now begins shifting into his concluding remarks with exhortations, expressions of gratitude, and final words of farewell. And we have to insert those remarks because he begins this fourth chapter as it was chronologically divided up later in time, but it was one one letter as it was written, the very beginning word of our particular passage begins with a therefore. And so anytime, men, that we see a therefore, there was substance before it. It's therefore a reason, so we have to understand the context of which we're reading. So Philippians chapter four, verses one through three, if you have a Bible, follow along with me. If not, follow along on the screen. Therefore, my brothers whom I love and long for, my joy and crown. Stand firm. Say, stand firm. Stand firm. Thus, in the Lord, my beloved, I entreat Euodia and entreat Synctichi to agree in the Lord. Yes, I ask you also, true companion, help these women who have labored side by side with me in the gospel together with Clement and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. Sean, thank you for giving me the passage where two women are having a disagreement (laughs) to talk to a group of men. Two women. This is going to be a great one, men. Notice, though, as we look at this particular passage, Paul has an endearing tone He has an endearing tone of gratitude and humility. He he begins transitioning in this letter to, like I said, a a term of encouragement and exhortation, but he, he wants to deal with this particular issue that he had caught wind of, and he wants to bring resolve and restoration and reconciliation to not let it hinder the witness and the advancement of the kingdom. And he wants to be winsome. Notice his terminology. He says, brothers, or some translations might say, beloved, a term of endearment. He then says, joy and crown. And that word crown at the time would have been, would have been a special term to the people of Philippi. They would have translated that really as a symbol for an athlete or a guest at a banquet. And Paul is saying that they, the people of that church, were his festal crown, that he would wear them as a symbol, as a sign of celebration and honor. And then he says, there is no joy in the world like bringing another soul to Jesus Christ. Just right out the gate, endearment, satisfaction, humility, and winsome. And here we find our first point of emphasis. This is our principle, men. If you're taking notes, this is our principle of the passage And this is our why, standing firm for the glory of God. Standing firm for the glory of God. Notice the first word in our passage this morning is therefore, and we talked about our our kingdom citizenship, and we read that it's there for that reason in the light of the fact that Christians, we are a colony, a citizenship of the kingdom of heaven, and that we eagerly expect the Lord Jesus to return, and that our hope is in him. So we stand firm. We stand firm, steadfast, and immovable in the concrete truth that Jesus is King. Jesus is Lord. We still have our mandate to make disciples. So therefore, we stand firm. Paul's reference here is to say, stand firm like a soldier standing at their post. Or as runners who must adhere without deviation to the course marked out by the gospel. And Paul is encouraging the church to keep living the Christian life faithfully. And in men, it's important for us to look at this 
example and exhortation of standing firm to apply it to our lives today. He's counseling us. So how do we do it? Men, we must stand firm and be steadfast in prayer. Steadfast in prayer. How much have you steeped your marriage in prayer? And I would tell you men, as I say those words, that the Holy Spirit saying, Jason, how much more do you need to steep your marriage in prayer? How much more men do we need to steep our children and our grandchildren in prayer? Our businesses, our friendships. We just prayed for years or for months leading up to a political campaign. And yes, men, it was important. I don't have to tell you that. Was that the finish line? We've arrived. Great. The hard work is done. No, men. Could I challenge us to be tenfold in our prayer that we would now stand firm even more so? Hey, God, yes, there's victory, but there's now greater opportunity. So would you prepare me, Lord, to stand firm to be salt and light, to be winsome, We need to cast off so we can continually be steadfast and advance the kingdom. Men, as we stand firm, we will have conflict. Conflict is necessary. It's an it's a aspect of life that we cannot hide from. And dare I say, men, you might be a little bit twisted if you just go looking for it. I know some of you, I can be guilty of this, but I think it's how God wired many of us is that we don't run from conflict, but when it arises, we meet it head on. Great. But just because we're a hammer, not everything is a nail. Sometimes you got to soften it. Don't run from it. Don't avoid it. But don't always hammer or crush it. Come in and be winsome. We need to remember that the enemy is out there, meaning it's not the people, but the enemy wants to steal, kill, and devour. He wants to isolate people. And the enemy sometimes wants to infiltrate his body and his people and get a foothold. We must remember that the enemy comes to steal, kill, and destroy. He is the prince of darkness, and he wants nothing more to divide God's people and his church, to disunite and to cause quarreling, quarreling factions so that lost people do not hear the good news that Christ the Lord is Savior and has come to seek and save the lost. We must recognize that and stand firm recognizing the schemes of our enemy because quarreling is a distraction that prohibits our witness and the advancement of the kingdom of God. We must be mature that even in a disagreement you don't dishonor or disrespect. I can't tell you how many different conversations I have been in, in life, but particularly over in the short period of time. Engaging the conversation. And men, I don't know about you, but there becomes a tipping point in a conversation where in your mind or in your thoughts, you just want to look at that person and say, you are so wrong. And it express maybe perhaps some other adjectives. You might even feel a physical reaction. That blood boiling, that vein begin to pop, that pulse in your head. Anybody ever felt that? I did two days ago. Watching the news, I'm like, oh Lord. Sometimes I got to turn it off. It's not good for my health. But there are times when I do engage it. And men, I would tell you, 
I recognize those moments as opportunities of sanctification to say, Lord, would you mature me in this situation that I don't lose my witness because I'm steeped in self, but I want to be sanctified in your spirit because I care more about your kingdom and to make a difference than proving a point. I want to be loving and winsome and communicate truth. And this drives us to the second point. We have our principle and we have our why to stand fast for the sake of the kingdom, and we do so because of the people. The people. Now, man, I'm not going to lie. When I was preparing this message, I had a flashback to my freshman year of high school. <laughs> and I don't know what, this, what brought this about, but I remember walking the hallways of my school and watching two girls fight. How fitting that we're talking about two girls having a disagreement. And watching these two girls fight, and this is the first time I'd ever witnessed it as a 15-year-old. And I'm talking like they are like getting at it, ripping each other's hair. Men, I didn't have a category for this. I'm thinking as a little boy, we just would punch, push, and be done. I mean, these girls were clawing, pulling hair. And I was like, I don't know what to do. And a lot of us guys were like, what do we do? Like, I think we're going to get hurt. <laughs> <laughs> they freaked us out. They do. Women can be dangerous. But it took an army of us to get in there and to bravely break it up. And we had no idea what they were fighting over. No clue. And likewise, what we see here are two women having a disagreement. Now, we don't necessarily know what the nature of the quarrel is, but if it were important, Paul would have noted it. And in our disagreements and conflicts, we can't make secondary matters be primary problems. We can't make anthills into mountains. We cannot major on the minors. I don't know how many other ways I should say this. Jesus Christ is king. Jesus Christ is Lord. Men, we must identify the true problem or source of conflict. Is our source of conflict, is it sin? Was it an offense against you or someone else? Is it, is it a simple personality clash that does happen from time to time? Not everyone can be perfect like you. Not everyone can look as good as you. Is it a simple matter of disagreement with methodology on how to execute something? Is it a doctrinal difference? Are we talking about a matter that is close-handed or open-handed? Are we talking about Jesus Christ is the Son of God? Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life that nobody comes to the Father except through him. So teriology, our justification, saved by grace through faith, close-handed issue. I will die on that hill. Will you? Like, we will have a great conversation on that. If you wanted to engage me on a cup of coffee and buy me some breakfast and talk about the four, perhaps five different views of eschatology, I would love to engage you in conversation, but my blood pressure will remain calm all day long to talk about that, because it's open-handed. Guess what? We're one day closer to Jesus returning, and I know he is. Praise God. And I don't know about you, but if he's coming back, that means I better continue to be obedient and faithful, and I better have a sense of urgency to make sure that I'm taking as many people to heaven with me. So no matter where you find yourself, make sure that you recognize you're fighting for the right things and not making mountains out of anthills. You can be right doctrinally, yet sinning in the way you use your correct view to think you're better than others. Or you use it to put them down for being wrong rather than gently to correct and build them up. I think the last time I was with you men... I used an illustration or a narrative talking about oftentimes it's not what we say that gets us in trouble, but it's how we say it. 
And I gave you an illustration with my wife, and she said, try that again. I think we resonate with that. The same is true with all of our conversations and conflicts. You, you might be dead on. What you're saying might be absolutely truth. But how you approach it and how you're expressing it could be dead wrong. These ladies, their differences may have had to do with church leadership and which of the two women was to have their greater voice and influence within the church of Philippi. But Paul's plea here for them to be of the same mind recalls Philippians chapter 2, verses 1 through 5. This is where he reverts back earlier in his letter where the general problems that plagued the Philippians were self-serving and self-seeking attitudes and were set over against act in this way in 2.5 and the self-sacrificing, self-giving attitude of Christ who was in the form of God but who poured himself out unselfishly in obedience for the good of others. And notice the phrase that Paul has used here in these few verses. He said it a couple times. He says, in the Lord. In the Lord. Unity among believers is essential and worth fighting for. Unity. Y'all say unity. Let me ask you this. Why is it that the army and the body of Jesus Christ is the only army that shoots its own or f- further wounds its own? In all the armies of the world, why is it that the army of Jesus Christ is the only army that shoots its own? We tack from within and we quarrel within on minor issues. And it's devastating. It's hurtful. It's sinful. It's it's steeped, quite honestly. If we were to just dissect it, and men, we can smoke screen it all we want and justify it all we want, but as soon as we let our guard down and just live in conviction, we would find ourselves rooted in pride and selfishness. As one of your church leaders, I would tell you that sheep bite. And I would also tell you that our pastor and many of your pastors, we love you. We care for you. We want to point you more to to, to Jesus. And if there's ever a situation... Don't talk about us, come talk with us. I can't speak for the others, but I can speak personally when I find out that a family has left our church for ABC reason. ABC reason. Perhaps I couldn't control anything, perhaps there was something I had a hand in, whatever it is. But it breaks my heart to find out that they decided to leave but didn't take any steps to resolve it because there was no steps of reconciliation, restitution, forgiveness. We couldn't even try to fix what we thought could have been wrong or where we did wrong. And sadly enough, people will avoid the conflict because they were never discipled on how to deal with conflict. And they're gonna go to another church. And what will they face, men? Conflict. And when they come across more conflict or something they don't like, and because they haven't been discipled in it, what will they be prone to do? Do the same thing. So it's not so much I'm just like, oh man, they don't like me. (laughs) Well, I really don't care about that. I care about their soul and I care about the discipleship and their sanctification and I care for their soul. And whether they choose to stay or not within this body, great. But I want them to understand what the Bible says about this. Last year we did a father-son event. And it was called uh, Out at Pure Adventure. If you guys have never heard about this, we did it actually just two weekends ago with our junior high and high school dads. Uh, We had about 80-something men and their fathers. All-day deal. And we're talking like we get out there, we're shooting guns, we're eating Ribs, 
sausage, corn, IBC root beer, burp contest, the whole deal. Shotgun skeet. There's a paintball contest. Last year when my son and I did this, we're on the paintball course. How many of y'all have ever done paintball before? Okay, the few, the proud. This is my very first time to do paintball last year. I was an idiot. So I'm playing paintball. And listen, my natural reaction is, okay, it's time to play. It's time to fight. Let's roll. Let's just, let's go. Okay. I'm not the kind that's just going to hide over here and just, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to snipe. Like, if that's you, God bless you. But I'm, let's, let's go. Okay. So I'm like, I'm running up to the front line and I'm crawling on my belly. And I'm in this thing. And I think I'm doing great because I'm just like popping all these guys and doing all the things. Not but five minutes into this match, I had a Forrest Gump moment. And by that, I mean something came up and bit me. And I had friendly fire from right behind me. Someone shot me right in the butt. That hurt. That hurt. I couldn't stay there any longer. I said, time out, time out. And I had to get out of the game. Man, I'm telling you, friendly fire hurts. Friendly fire hurts. There are times, men, where the wounds of a friend, they bring healing. But we've got to do it face to face, not from behind. We've got to be men who talk with each other, to each other, not about each other. We can't talk about the issues. Let's talk with people. Let's bring reconciliation. Psalm 133.1 says, Behold, how good, how good and pleasing it is when brothers dwell together in unity. Unity. One of my greatest joys in 20 years of being in ministry is walking into the lives of young men in locker rooms and on fields, sharing the gospel message with them, but particularly over these past two years, being the faith coach, it's just a fancy word for saying chaplain, of our, being the faith coach for our PCA football team. Coach Yanta says, allowed me and invited me to be a part of the team. And it has been such a gift to be woven into the, the lives of these men, these young, young men who are playing this game. But I want to tell you guys, what you see on the field is just the tip of the iceberg. And if we could peel back the layers and the onions, uh, the layers of the onion here, and really begin looking underneath the surface, you know what we really start digging into and really start preaching and really start emphasizing to these men is this right here. Hey, guys, how good and pleasing it is when brothers dwell together in unity, centered on the common bond of Jesus Christ, our King, our Lord. Because the army of Jesus, we are stronger together then we are separate, and we must fight for unity. Our strength isn't in how long we've been Christians, how much we know about the Bible, how many mission trips we've been on. Our strength for standing firm is in our union with Christ. And this means if you're not a Christian, look no further for the application to your life. You need to be in Christ. Paul just talked about having your name in the book of life, and that's what you need. You need to be in Christ because you're at odds. You're at war with God himself, and Jesus invites you. You need to know him as your Lord and Savior. If you're a believer, Paul isn't calling you to simply try harder. His exhortations do require effort. However, they are empowered through our union with Jesus. And they are supercharged through our communion with him. This leads us to our last point. And this is our challenge today in application, the peacemaker. To be the peacemaker. We have the principle of the people and the peacemaker. Paul was a realist and knew how difficult it would be for the church to come to an agreement on their own, and they needed a third party. They needed a reconciler, someone to help bring counsel. If we could draw upon the words in Matthew chapter 18, verses 15 through 20, if your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault. Between you and him alone, 
Men, lean in for a moment. If he listens to you, you have gained your brother. But if he does not listen, take one or two others along with you that every charge may be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. Truly I say to you, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you lose on earth shall be loosed in he- loosened in heaven. Again, I say to you, if two of you agree on earth about anything they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am among them. <laughs> Just contextually for a moment, whenever we hear that phrase, we're not talking about worship, we're talking about church discipline. <laughs> you see that? Now, so many of our relational problems and disagreements right here, men, would be quickly and wisely resolved if we followed this guideline. Right here. Conflicts and disagreements, 101, Matthew 18. We go to our brothers. We go to our people. To take initiative in going to the other person to try to clear up the problem between us. And one common mistake or sin is the one who feels wrong to talk to many others about the person who wronged them rather than going to directly to the person Find and entrust godly people if you need help. But don't go slander another person behind their back. Find godly counsel. Find godly wisdom. And I want to say this before I give you a few more passages of Scripture and give you a few questions to dialogue before we break. Men, don't allow imperfect people to keep you from our perfect God. Don't allow sinful, flawed people keep you from our perfect God. You have been reconciled unto the Lord himself through Jesus Christ and have been given the ministry of reconciliation to be a city on a hill, to be a voice of forgiveness and grace. How much more has Jesus forgiven you than you ought to go then forgive others? I give you these three verses, Romans 12, 18. If it is possible, as much as it depends on you, live peaceably with how many of the men? All. Proverbs 18, 19, a brother offended is harder to win than a strong city and contentions are like the bars of a castle. Titus 3, remind them to be submissive to rulers and authorities, to be obedient, to be ready for every good work, to speak evil of no one, to avoid quarreling, to be gentle, and to show perfect courtesy toward all people. For we ourselves were once foolish, disobedient, led astray, slaves to various passions and pleasures, passing our days in malice and envy, hated by others and hating one another. I don't know about you, but I'm grateful that when I was eight years old and while I was still a sinner, Christ came and died for me. And that his forgiveness was demonstrated by the blood of Jesus, forgiving me of my offense to him and where he invited me into this ministry of reconciliation. Men, disagreements and conflict are a part of life. We can run and hide and avoid. We can address and be sinful even in how we approach. Or we can be steeped in prayer, led by the Spirit, recognizing we have a mission to stand firm to advance the kingdom of God, recognize we can fight for unity, in the, unity for the people, for the kingdom, and we can be peacemakers for the sake of Jesus. So men, there's a few questions that I want you guys to grapple with. You may have to disarm a little bit. Maybe you don't feel prepared or ready to talk about some of this. Even if you don't, I would challenge you to take a picture of these questions. So if the men in this room maybe perhaps aren't your accountability guys or the guys that you're really going to let your hair down with, if you have some. But I do dare say to you, men, you need to reconcile these questions in your soul. And if there's someone that you need to seek out and reconcile with today, don't let the sun go down without doing it. Pick up a phone. FaceTime. 
Bend your knee if you need to. Lay down your pride. Be a minister of reconciliation for the sake of Jesus. God, thank you for this morning, for the gift of life, and for waking us up and for stirring us up by your word today. Father, for Paul's words to the, to the, to the church. God, I pray, Lord, that we would see this example on how to deal with reconciliation properly, wisely, and with all humility. Jesus, I pray, Lord, that you would give these men right now boldness and courage to lay down their pride and to be reconcilers. Forgive us, Lord, where we fail. You strengthen us in our weakness. May you be glorified in and through us. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Love you, men. Thank you all for coming.